Good afternoon, everyone. So we're very pleased to be sharing with you this afternoon uh, some of the key findings and lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, allow me to share a little bit about the background um, of this project. We actually started work on this project as early as December 2020. Uh, being one of the most disaster-prone countries, um, in fact, we rank number eight um, in terms of most affected country by extreme weather events, according to the World Risk Index in, uh, of, as of 2021. Um, I thought it was very important that we do post-disaster assessment. Uh, very seldom do we do um, post-disaster assessment, and so I think this is one of the reasons why um, it seems like we always start from scratch whenever a shock hits us. So I thought that if we do um, document our responses and lessons learned uh, from this pandemic, it would help us learn from our experience and also help us manage future shocks. So I'm very grateful to the fellows who actually contributed to um, this particular initiative. Um, next slide, please. So. Um, for this afternoon, um, actually, we will be um, sharing with you um, uh, about the book, the status and impacts, government policy responses, um, issue and concerns in, in the pandemic response, and lessons learned by, by sectors. So I'll be providing the overview, but as Dr. Balaceros mentioned earlier for this afternoon, we're actually going to highlight um, some of the sectoral findings, specifically on health by Dr. Ulep and um, on education by Dr. Um, or beta, and also um, the macro responses and lessons learned um, by Dr. Um, Maggie Gonzalez. Um, so for this afternoon, I will be focusing on um, the Philippines response to the COVID-19 pandemic, learning from experience and emerging stronger to future shocks, um, which I co-authored with, um, of course, a very um, excellent uh, researchers, um, Tina Ortiz, Rita Vargas, and Arkin Ar Arboneda. So um, in terms of the objectives of the book, um, the book was really intended to um, do the following, examine the observable impacts of the pandemic on various sectors of the Philippine economy and society, document the government's response to the pandemic, identify gaps, issues, and challenges in the government response to the pandemic, and finally provide some recommendations to help decision makers craft and implement better policies. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's really to learn from um, our experience with a shock and hopefully help us manage future shocks uh, better. Um, next. So um, for the theme paper, um, which uh, we will be presenting um, today, um, there are also, um, which as I mentioned earlier, um, was done by our team, um, Tina and Rita are actually here and we're hoping Arkin is also um, uh, watching. Um, we also have several background papers that have been prepared by the different fellows and also our, our current president of PIDS, as well as um, um, Dr. Sheila Shiar, who's actually uh, the head of our RID. Let me just go back to the previous slide. Um, so the first paper that started it all was actually the paper done by Dr. Abrigo and, and colleagues, um, including Dr. Ulep and um, Dr. Francisco and um, and Jana Uy. And that was the projected disease transmission, health system requirements, and macroeconomic impacts. This was done um, as early as April 2020. And, and um, what they did was actually to come up with some projections in terms of what would be the likely impacts of the pandemic, um, not just in terms of health, but also in terms of the, the economy. And in addition to that, um, we actually have um, the other background papers on health by Dr. Ulep. Um, we also have the macro responses by Dr. Gonzalez, which uh, both of them will be presenting today. Um, findings on food security in the Philippines by Dr. Briones and um, impacts on the Filipino migrant workers by Dr. Tabuga and um, Carlos Caballero inequality and human development in the Philippines by Dr. Navarro. Um, we also did um, this paper mitigating the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on poverty. Um, 
And then the next one is poverty, the middle class and income distribution uh, by, by Dr. Albert, Dr. Abrigo, Dr. Kimba, and um, Jana Vismanos. And the paper on education, um, which will be uh, presented this afternoon by Dr. Orbeta, and uh, crisis and risk communication uh, by Dr. Uh, Sheila Siar, and national and local government's fiscal response and role in recovery. Unfortunately, we don't have time to present all of this, so we've selected only um, some of the papers to be presented this afternoon. Next. So let me turn to uh, status and, and impacts. Um, as we all know, um, this has been a very big shock to, to the Philippines. The Philippines placed 24th and 26th with the highest cumulative cases and deaths, respectively, among 236 economies as of June 2021. So as of June 2021, we've had 1.4, about 1.4 million um, total cases and um, about 24,000 deaths. And um, that has actually increased um, so that as of May 24, 2022, we have almost um, 3.6 million cases and um, 60,000 um, deaths. Next. And among ASEAN member states, the Philippines ranked second with highest cases and deaths and biggest economic contraction in 2021. Next. So we actually experienced 9.6 percent contraction in um, 2020. So what was the initial response of the government? Um, as we can see, as detailed here in the table, um, actually the government resorted to um, um, uh, monitoring of the Philippine borders, tighter screening of passengers, halting of visa issuance, and restrictions on inbound flights. Um, the Interagency Task Force was also convened for the first time. And in February, flight restrictions were extended to other territories, such as those coming from mainland China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. And in March, as the first case of local transmission was reported, Restrictions on quarantines with different levels. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with this. The ECQ, GCQ, modified GCQ um, were um, actually implemented. And notably, the Philippines has been recognized as one of the countries with the longest and strictest lockdown in 2020. Next, please. Um, however, we find that this... Um, um, restrictions on the people's mobility coupled with the fear of contracting the virus hampered economic activities causing businesses to either temporarily or permanently shut down. Um, immediately as a result, unemployment rose and hit a record high of 17.6% in the second quarter of 2020 or 10.4% for the whole year of 2020. Um, or 10.3%, um, rather. Meanwhile, underemployment rate suddenly reverted to its 2018 level. So the bar chart uh, shows that the industry sector experienced the most reduction in employed persons, largely owing to the decline in the manufacturing subsector. And the services sector actually also reduced by 8.5%, owing to the decrease in employment in accommodation and food service. So those are your hotels and restaurants. Um, arts, entertainment and recreation, information and communication, and real estate activities. Next. So in, uh, by 20, um, by the second quarter of, of 2020, the Philippines entered recession um, with a contraction of 16.9%. So that for the whole year of 2020, real GDP um, contracted by 9.6%. Um, this was the deepest recession in history since post-war, um, what we experienced in, in 2020. In the second quarter, particularly quarterly GDP growth um, dipped by 16.9%, bringing the annual GDP decline to 9.6% in 2020. So what made our economy highly vulnerable? Our economy is largely reliant on the services sector, and as can be seen, the most gravely hit sectors are under the services, such as the accommodation and food service activities, transportation and storage, which were affected as lockdowns were implemented. Next. 
On the expenditure side, um, only government spending posted positive growth in 2020, albeit still lower than that of the previous year. Gross capital formation experienced the largest decline, followed by um, household spending. The consumer outlook were also very low in the latter half of 2020, which was mainly attributed to the pandemic, in addition to the seen increase in unemployment, reduced incomes, and faster increase in the prices of goods. Next, please. And in the education sector, schools were compelled to shift to remote learning, so elementary schools are the most affected in terms of enrollment and overall there's a three percent decline in school participation in um, basic education and um dr um or Beto will actually be um, sharing the details about this um, next slide so in the table we see that the private schools experienced um 21.6 percent decline in enrollment or equivalent to about one million um, students. So um, it was really the private sector that was uh, the private school attendance that was most affected by, by the pandemic. Next. And in terms of the major mode of learning, um, we found that um, students were then compelled to rely on other modes of learning um, because of the lockdown. So data showed that majority of the students in public schools relied on printed modules while those in private schools shifted to blended learning. And this is how, somehow reflective of the di digital divide that exists in the country as shown by the FIES 2018 data set. And we see that there's a large um, disproportion in terms of access to computers by um, income decile. Turning to poverty, um, as we would expect, uh, poverty incidence and magnitude would um, is expected to worsen due to the pandemic, reversing recent gains in poverty reduction. So um, using the um, actual contraction in GDP in 2020 of 9.6%, the simulated poverty incidence among families um, would actually um, increase. Um, this is um, without, um, without SAP without the social assistance um, amelioration program. And so we would see that um, the actual data is for 2018 um, is 12.1%. That's the proportion of uh, poor families um, because of the growth in 20, economic growth in 2019 that was expected to go down further to 10.6, but because of the pandemic, it's expected to go up to 16%. And then because of the um, slight recovery or turnaround in 2021, um, poverty incidence is expected to um, improve a little better in, in 2021 to 14%. So this is um, our simulations showing the uh, expected trend in, in poverty. Next. So um, we only have data, actual data for the first semester of um, 2021, and that would actually be shown in the green um, line, um, showing that uh, based on the official data, if the poverty incidence based on the first semester data of 2018 is 21.1%, um, the data for the first semester of 2021 shows that it's has gone up to 23.7 percent. Um, the line at the bottom actually um, shows the actual um, data using full year. So 23.5 percent in 2015 and 16.7 percent in 2018. And what we did was actually to uh, append or um, show our um, simulation results. And what we're showing here is that um, by 2019, this is the poverty incidence among population. It would have gone down to 14.8%, but would have gone up to 21.5% by 2020, and then down to 19% by 2021. And this is without the without considering the positive impacts of um, social amelioration program on poverty reduction. And I'll go back to SAP later on. Unfortunately, the data that we have right now actually do not distinguish between chronic and transient poverty. And our previous studies have shown that those who are considered poor at any one point in time 
um, actually consist of two groups, those who are chronically poor, meaning consistently poor all throughout, and those who just um, move into poverty because of some shock. And uh, as we can see and as we would expect, because of this shock, many families would have, or many individuals or families would have fallen into poverty because of this shock. And unfortunately, we don't have that kind of information. And that's something I think that we need to um, address um, in the near future, coming up with um, more information in terms of um, chronic and transient poverty so that we can actually um, understand better the dynamics of poverty and more importantly, be able to formulate appropriate interventions. Because what we have seen in our previous study is that about half of those who are um, considered poor are chronically poor or consistently poor all throughout, while the other half are just transient poor or those who are uh, who just um, moved into poverty because of some shock. Next, please. So what have been the, the government uh, responses? Next. So um, the, the government has legislated um, two um, important um, um, legislation, pieces of legislation, Bayanihan 1 and Bayanihan 2. Uh, Bayanihan 1 to heal, or Bayanihan to heal as one act um, was enacted in March 2020, granting the president special powers to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. And as of June 2021, the total budget allocated for that was 394.4 billion pesos. And about, um, you know, 96.8 percent has been dispersed as of uh, June 2021. And we can see that most of it has actually been allocated to the SWD, and that's actually uh, mostly uh, SAP and among other um, subsidies to, um, to the individuals and, and families. In addition, Bayanihan 2, um, or Bayanihan to Recover as One Act, was also enacted, and that was in September 2020, providing for pandemic response and recovery interventions. And the budget allocation for that was 214.1 billion, and uh, about 89% of that has been dispersed as of June 2021. And you can see that um, for this particular um, uh, fund, um, a large part of it went to um, SSS. Next. So what were the emergency measures implemented during the ECQ? Um, and these were anchored on the emergency measures provided under the Bayanihan one. So we have um, different cash assistance programs, including the social amel amelioration program, Rice Farmers Financial Assistance Program. We have the COVID-19 Adjustment Measures Program for OFW and workers in the formal sector implemented by the Department of Labor and Employment. We also have in-kind assistance, um, you know, from OWA, transportation, food, accommodation for our overseas workers. Um, agricultural products to LGUs by the Department of Agriculture. We have the free bus ride program for health workers from the Department of Transportation. They bring Sakai program and point-to-point -point bus augmentation scheme uh, system from the MMDA and uh, food and non-food items provided by DSWD. In addition, we have the wage subsidy for small businesses um, implemented by the um, DOF. This is under the small business wage subsidy program for workers in the formal sector. And there were also grants, loans, assistance programs provided by the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Trade and Industry, the latter primarily for medium, um, micro, small, and medium enterprises. We also have the Emergency Employment Program, Tulong Panghanap Buhay, sa ating disadvantaged displaced workers, um, Barangay Ko, Buhay Ko Project, uh, which aims to employ displaced um, workers. And um, finally, we also have um, the program of SSS, uh, which provides calamity loans um, of up to 20,000 pesos. Next. Um, so um, we can see that um, actually a lot of programs has been um, have been implemented by the government and uh, to assist low income families, displaced workers, farmers, and OFWs, among others who were affected by the pandemic. And this chart just shows um, how much was allocated, um, target beneficiaries, number of target beneficiaries, as well as the benefits given and. Let me just focus on the social amelioration program, um, emergency subsidies 
program um, for this particular one, um, there were two tranches of assistance given to um, low-income families, um, and the first tranche uh, covered about 18 million um, families. So you can imagine it's more than half of the um, total number of, of families. And then the second tranche covered a slightly lower number of families, 14 million, and the benefit given was about 5,000 to um, 8,000. Um, I don't have time to discuss all of them, so I let me just go to to the next um, slide, um, because this is something that uh, we would like to, to focus on because of the size of the program. So this was uh, the target beneficiaries of SAP um, were primarily poor families registered in the Pantawid Pamilyang Filipino Program or the four Ps. It was also intended to cover informal economy workers, such as the self-employed, small-scale small, small scale producers and distributors, and also those belonging to vulnerable sectors, such as senior citizens, persons with disability, pregnant and lactating women, solo parents, overseas Filipinos in distress, and indigent indigenous um, peoples. I think you already have a sense that um, while this is, I, I think, very good, you can already imagine the challenge in terms of identifying and locating all of these target beneficiaries. Um, so that's one of the, the major um, challenges in implementing such a, a big program covering um, so many target beneficiaries. And as I've mentioned, the financial assistance amounted to 5,000 to 8,000, depending on the regional minimum wage rate where the beneficiary is, is located. Next. So um, what we did was to simulate what would be the impact of these cash transfers from the social amelioration program. And as we can see um, here, if you look at the first few um, uh, rows, um, if the poverty incidence is projected to be uh, poverty incidence among families is projected to be 16% without the social amelioration program. With the cash transfer from this program, it is projected to go down to 12.2%. So very significant decline in poverty incidence because of the sheer size of the, the amount the cash transfer given, as well as the um, large number of beneficiaries covered by, by this program. And similarly, the poverty incidence among population would have gone down from 21.5% to 17.3% because of the cash transfer. Next, please. So there were other government responses, so mobility restrictions uh, due to localized lockdown, community quarantines. There was also efforts to improve awareness. Uh, so there were a lot of information dissemination campaigns. Um, there were general guidelines issued, so creation of a national action plan primarily on test, trace, and treat. And there was also health system support, so augmentation of human resources for health and expansion of facilities for treatment and isolation and protection, so including So um, let me just share some issues and concerns in the pandemic response. Um, next. So for instance, in communication issues, we find that the communication interventions for COVID-19 response in the Philippines can be characterized as late, incoherent, big, and, and confusing. And um, the details are actually um, in one of the papers in this volume um, as authored by Dr. Sheila Siar. There's also lack of expanded and targeting testing and aggressive contact tracing. So the country lagged in contact tracing and ramped up testing, which are among the more effective response strategies employed in most in most countries. Also, the country was the government was late in implementing much needed preventive measures at the onset of the health crisis. The implementation of community quarantines became the go to response whenever there is an impending surge of cases. Unfortunately, lockdowns were complemented with weak contact tracing and testing efforts. Next. Um, there were also um, 
issues related to data. So having clear, accurate, timely, and granular data is important to identify appropriate response strategies and policies promptly. Unfortunately, serious data issues were evident in um, the Philippines. Data issues were also observed in targeting beneficiaries for the provision of assistance to affected individuals and families, which in turn led to delays in the distribution of aid. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, um, trying to identify and locate 18 million eligible um, families was, was quite a challenge. Um, inadequate consultation with public health professionals and experts led to poorly planned policies that are in contrast with the advice of medical experts. And also there's a lack of a strongly coordinated implementation framework. So vertical and horizontal plans and operations were not fully aligned. So what were some of the lessons learned um, by, by sector? And the reason we're pulled, we're trying to put them all together is because we're hoping that from this, uh, we could probably manage uh, future shocks uh, better. So um, in the area of health and community quarantines, we find that imposing community quarantines or lockdowns is helpful, but not sufficient in suppressing the outbreak. I will let Dr. Ulep um, discuss more um, the other lessons and, and findings in, in the health sector when he does his presentation later today. Next. In the area of education, I, I think um, our experience in terms of different learning modalities um, is going to be um, very useful um, moving forward from, from this pandemic. And again, Dr. Orbeta um, is in a better position to discuss um, the lessons learned in this particular sector. Next. Um, and of course, macroeconomic response is key, um, not just during the pandemic, but in terms of moving forward uh, on our road to, to recovery. And, um, and what we've seen is that monetary easing, public spending, and certain demand substitution helped spur growth in some subsectors. And Dr. Maggie Gonzalez will be presenting us um, the details um, this afternoon as well. Now, um, let me just talk a little bit more about some of the other sectors because we don't have uh, the opportunity to hear from the other uh, chapters. Uh, in terms of data, ICT, and digitalization, we find that more granular data are necessary to formulate and implement data-driven responses. Um, the national government directly needs to strengthen digitalization strategies to improve the use and access to ICT. And the government must accelerate investments in ICT infrastructure to prevent the worsening of inequalities in the education sector. And the government plays a significant role in enhancing digitalization in the economy by supporting financial innovations to reach the unbanked and promoting digital payments in public transactions. So this would help a lot in the distribution, particularly of cash transfers. The full implementation of the national ID system as a foundational digital ID system and its linking to the existing social protection information systems is essential in ensuring the efficient and effective execution of crisis-related social assistance programs. But let me point out that um, you know, having the national ID is not adequate to be able to identify and to identify eligible beneficiaries. So you have to link it with existing uh, information systems to better identify eligible beneficiaries. Next. And in terms of social protection, um, uh, social safety nets that are effective, properly targeted, and well distributed are necessary to help Filipino families cope with the damaging effects of the pandemic. Equally important are strong leadership and data-driven decision-making in executing the pandemic response. We also find that modifying existing assistance programs instead of creating new ones with new mechanisms for implementation may be a more efficient approach in crisis response, and this would allow us to respond faster. In line with the imposition of community quarantines, the national government must also ensure that people have access to food and other necessities through massive safety nets programs. And adequate universal health coverage can greatly help in future public emergencies, especially health-related ones. And while emergency cash transfers and formal and food relief packages are needed to smooth consumption, Programs that will assist households to have jobs and restart their business are necessary, especially if we want those who temporarily fell into poverty to be able to recover more quickly and move out of poverty. 
Emergency subsidies such as monetary assistance, food and non-food items are essential to augment the needs of Filipino families during a pandemic. And again, this is something that's very important. We always want to um, be ready with a list of eligible beneficiaries for different programs. So establishing interoperable databases across government agencies is vital in crafting effective and timely policies during public emergencies. And the national ID can actually provide um, that variable to be able to merge the different um, administrative databases. And um, next. And we also have uh, the important role of local government units because the whole of government approach is necessary for implementing the pandemic response. And um, with that, um, the communication, uh, as I mentioned, something that's very important, there's a need to harmonize messages used at the national and local levels to ensure accuracy and inconsistency. And a very important policies and protocols should be widely disseminated ahead of implementation dates so that everybody um, can adjust to um, new policies and, and protocols. And citizen engagement should be widely uh, promoted and role of public policy information officers should be strengthened. And um, with that, I would like to thank you and I'll turn it over to um, Dr. CR. Thank you.